and introduce our next awardee. here 
when they selected Yucca as the site. And I will tell you, it had nothing to do with science. It had everything to do with political science, just picking a location, regardless of the earthquake fault, regardless of the river nearby, regardless of whether or not it would ever be constructed. But it didn't make any difference whether $10 billion would be wasted or $20 billion because the nuclear industry wanted a place to bury this stuff and to move it across our country in trucks from every location. A mobile Chernobyl is just moving through our country, you know, regardless of what the dangers on the streets of our nation might be. Uh, and so here we are now, uh, back on the on the floor where I made all the amendments against Yucca Mountain. And uh, what I did in 1995, right after. New Cambridge took off over and they once again tried to revive it. You know, I looked to uh, the Gershwin brothers for inspiration. <laughs> and with apologies to them. Uh, it's very clean. <laughs> Plutonium is here to stay. <laughs> Not for a year, but forever and a day. <laughs> the Rockies may tumble. Yucca, they crumble, they're only made of clay, but plutonium is here to stay. I thank all of you for having me here for this award ceremony, which means more to me than you can ever know. And my dear friend, Barbara Lee, who is going to receive an award this evening. She and I were separated at birth <laughs> when it comes to nuclear issues. Uh, to Susan Gordon, congratulations for your incredible work. Thank you so much for everything that you've done. Thank you for um, Carrie Lodge, thank you for everything that you have done. A lawyer's analysis, dissecting you know, the insanity of all of the lies that have been perpetrated about uh, nuclear technology throughout the years. And our grassroots activists of the year, Bill Mitchell. So we thank you, Bill, because you represent the millions of people across the country who cannot be here today, but are ready, are ready to do the fighting. Right? So congratulations for everything that you have done. So I have worked in this building beginning 42 years ago uh, as um, someone in partnership with you to advance a nuclear non-proliferation agenda for our country. 35 years ago, I wrote a book, Nuclear Peril, The Politics of Proliferation, that just showed how all of the slimy little deals get cut and ensure that nuclear power plants will be built without full-scope safeguards that allow plutonium and uranium to be used by countries around the world to construct nuclear weapons that they should never have had access to the material in the first place. Uh, and I wrote in that book that by the 21st century, we may be asking not who has the bomb, but who doesn't have the bomb. Yeah. Well, in 2018, that list is the United States, China, France, Russia, the United Kingdom, India, Israel, and Pakistan, and the newest entry, North Korea. Clearly, our work together on stopping the spread of the world's deadliest weapon is as important as it has ever been. That's right. But because of activism around the planet, we still have a relatively short list of countries that we are working hard to ensure does not expand any further than it has already. The Trump administration has reversed decades of our U.S. leadership towards a nuclear weapons-free 
world. Yeah. In its nuclear posture review issued earlier this year, the administration lays out plans for a new nuclear arms race. President Trump, who has threatened other countries with fire and fury, wants new, more usable nuclear weapons. He wants a so-called low-yield submarine launch ballistic missile. Low-yield nuclear weapon. That's like a it's like an oxymoron, like jumbo shrimp or, <laughs> or Salt Lake City nightlife. I mean, there is no such thing. A low yield nuclear weapon is a contradiction in terms. Huh? What are they talking about? Where do you use that nuclear weapon? He has laid out more instances when we might use these weapons, like against a significant non nuclear strategic attack. That sounds like a cyber attack to me. Does anyone in this room really think it's a good idea to threaten a nuclear response to a cyber attack on the United States? That moment in history where we use nuclear weapons to respond to a cyber attack will make every other issue that we are debating here in this building a footnote in history. Because all history will be measured on that moment for our nuclear weapon issues in response to a cyber attack. So we are at a turning point here in the United States. And at the same time, our lack of non-proliferation leadership abroad is equally concerning. We have pulled out of the Iran nuclear deal, a deal that was doing exactly what it was designed to do to verifiably ensure Iran could not get a nuclear weapon. And simultaneously, the Trump administration is negotiating a civil nuclear cooperation agreement with Saudi Arabia, whose top leaders have made clear they are willing to pursue nuclear weapons if they think it is necessary for them to counter Iran. And by the way, the Trump administration seems so eager to reach a deal that it may not require the gold standard or a commitment from Saudi Arabia not to enrich or reprocess nuclear materials that can be used in nuclear bombs. We've also failed to substantially engage Russia in meaningful discussions about how to continue reducing our respective nuclear weapons arsenals, the most dangerous in the world. We haven't announced even our intent to extend by five years the New START Treaty and its critical caps on deployed strategic nuclear weapons and delivery systems. We have unwisely responded to Russia's non-compliance with its Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty by immediately threatening to pursue our own intermediate-range missiles. What sense does that make that more missiles is a response rather than a negotiation to reduce the incredible tensions that are building between the United States and Russia. And in North Korea, President Trump has gone from threatening to totally destroy the entire country to being so eager to make a deal that many of us worry he will forget what exactly a deal must include. Of course, I support diplomacy of any kind, but the last four presidents have concluded framework agreements to address the threat from North Korea's nuclear program. They have all fallen apart, and the danger posed by North Korea's nuclear program has continued to progress. There is much to cause dismay, but this is a place we have been before. If President Trump wants to unretire old weapon systems like the B-83 Megaton gravity bomb and the sea launch cruise missiles, then we will unretire the movement activists that put more than a million people in Central Park to the nuclear freeze movement in May of 1983. I was, I was 
the only politician allowed to speak to that million people that day in Central Park. And it was because I had introduced the nuclear freeze resolution in the House of Representatives and absolutely amazing this building we had gone from no co-sponsors on March 1st of 1982 to my having 200 co-sponsors by June of 1982 because the grassroots rose up in this country to say with all of the common sense that is imaginable that the problem with the nuclear arms race is the nuclear arms race. It's the very mentality that drives the entire insanity of more nuclear weapons making the world a safer place to live. So we need a movement to join with Congressman Ted Lieu and me in support of our nuclear no first use bill that says no American president, especially President Donald Trump, should be able to unilaterally launch nuclear weapons without provocation, without consultation, without warning, and without the United States having been attacked with the war. up to the Trump administration and its gold-plated defense industry allies looking to build more bombs and demand that we invest in, in, in instead that we invest in more education not invest in annihilation that's why I have introduced legislation that would cut 100 billion dollars from our bloated nuclear weapons yeah. call out the Trump administration's nuclear modernization effort for what it is, nothing more than a budgetary boondoggle yes. that will not add anything to the defense of the United States of America. In fact, it will make us less safe because our, our enemies, our adversaries will become more fearful, more likely that they keep the finger on their buttons that could trigger an accidental nuclear war. That is what Donald Trump is driving us inexorably, inevitably, and eventually towards in this country and on this planet. And we need this movement to ensure that diplomacy above all else is the watchword of our efforts in North Korea. If the talks between President Trump and Kim Jong-un do not go well, it is not an excuse to justify military action for a situation that has no military solution. A second Korean war is absolutely unacceptable of Donald Trump. <laughs> family, service members, and our allies to say unequivocally that we did everything in our power to curb North Korea's dangerous behavior without resorting to armed conflict. This is the time you are the people. In my book, Nuclear Peril, I wrote, nuclear proliferation is a problem too long ignored. Now before it is too late, the public must draw the line. The stakes are too high. You are that public and the stakes for our planet have never been higher. We're going through a funny period in America right now. We're nostalgia for a time that never existed yeah. <laughs> has replaced the idealism that we need to deal yeah. with the problems of our right. country and our planet. But for the poor and the sick and the elderly, the past is just the memory. The future is their high reality. And we cannot squander funding on nuclear weapons, on nuclear programs, on nuclear repositories that we do not need, and instead steal that money from the mouths of children who need a food stamp program, of elderly who need care in nursing homes. We cannot make that choice in good conscience, which is 
why I'm so proud to be here with you. Because the least that we should be able to say, if a nuclear war does break out in North Korea, is that we tried. We really tried to avoid that catastrophe. And that's why I'm so proud of you because you are the full Thank you for everything. Well, here I am. I'm your sister. 
Church, I work in women's health. He knew that. Did I know he worked on women's health? He worked on women's health. I've never heard it until that night. And what I know is um, that although Ralph and I and his nephews and the Christian listened to Tara, his remembrances like this, that of his good works, of his contributions, and of his amazing colleagues and friends, that will keep the alive in our memories. And I can't thank you enough for letting me talk with you about it.
I'm going to be 65 in a couple of weeks. So um, my initial concerns were with the fallout from the uh, atmospheric uh, nuclear testing. So I asked my teacher, so uh, what are we going to do? It's going to come down to the contaminated soil. What are we going to do? Some people tell me. So I started to work on it. Um, I find it amazing that all of you are here working so hard consistently and continuously. And I just want you to know that I appreciate all the work that you do, all the technical uh, information that you provide. It's, it's just amazing the minds that are in this room that A and A work with. Um, and you know you're in my heart and you will be forever. So I just want you to know that I appreciate you. I appreciate you giving me this. Um, and I want to say thank you. Talking about in our meetings the past two days makes it clear that 